today's focus will be on, on wildfire-based disasters, but disaster preparedness and business resilience is responsive to any kind of catastrophe, whether it's your own individual building burning down, whether it's a flood. We're, we do this work because uh, in business resiliency and in small business resiliency in particular because uh, the risk of natural disaster is growing. Uh, disasters are growing in intensity, in impact, and in unpredictability over the years. Um, and this, if you can't see, this is a time period from 2018 back to 1980. Aside from the growth trajectory that's shown here, one of the most interesting things that I find on this chart is the, um, is the increase in the green bar, which you probably can't read, but it is owing to severe storm. This is an indication of the way in which our weather patterns are changing and becoming more unpredictable and more severe. Take that and combine it with the fact that almost 60% of businesses have no disaster recovery plan. What this turns into is that 40 to 60% of small businesses never reopen again after a major disaster. If you've had a broad-based natural disaster in a community that's fairly self-contained and you're looking at a business failure rate or a business closure rate of 40 to 60%, that's got devastating longer-term implications on employment and on overall economic health of that community. And so what we're aiming to do here is get the word out about the importance of planning and preparedness in order to increase your ability to respond in the aftermath of a disaster when needed. We've created a business resiliency toolkit, which is online at resilientbusiness.org. Um, it steps through five steps of the process of creating uh, a business resiliency plan. Our agenda today is going to follow that model fairly closely. First, we start really broadly looking at how, uh, how to understand the risks of the environment in which your business is operating and is situated. And that involves um, understanding what risks your community is uh, particularly vulnerable to. Then we're going to move to, then the next step is thinking a little bit more specifically about your own business, assessing what readiness you may already have in place. If you have some, that's great. If you don't have any preparations or plans, that's fine too. We just need to know where you are so that you can start from there and build from there. The next item is called Take Action. I will warn you that this part of the um, toolkit is deceptively compact looking because when you click on it online, it expands into the bulk of the work that you need to do to, put, to get a resiliency plan in place for your business. Um, and then I want to jump to this last item here, uh, which we'll touch on a little bit at the beginning, which is about engaging with community resiliency activities. Um, Studies show that the more tightly a community is connected to itself and people are connected to their community, the more resilient they're capable of being in the aftermath of a disaster. And so it's really important ahead of that to make sure that you as, a, as an individual and your business as an entity have tight connections within your community so that those are there to be relied upon um, if need ends up uh, showing up. Um, for those of you that know me, I write an article in the union every week, and uh, if you read those articles, you know that they're usually made up of an acronym. So my acronym for today is FIRE. Basically, here's, here's a quick story. It was about, um, about 1 o'clock in the morning when I started to wake up kind of from the smell of some smoke, and there's a kind of that twilight place when you're waking up where it's in between dreamland and reality and kind of what's going on in your environment. And so I was like, do I smell smoke or am I dreaming? And then right about that time, I heard a pounding on our door, and it was the sheriff's office saying, you've got five minutes to evacuate, okay? Family of five, three kids, uh, my wife and myself, actually uh, a dog, a cat, and two guinea pigs, okay? The knock on the door, five minutes to evacuate. I thought we were prepared. I thought we had a good plan for evacuating. And I'll tell you, when you can see, you know, less than a half a mile away, the tops of the trees on fire from your home, the plan goes out the window. And so what was really most important was family, okay? Anything with a heartbeat, that's what needs to get out, okay? So family first. The, the I is insurance, okay? We had auto insurance, homeowners insurance, business interruption insurance, um, major assets are insured. So that gave me peace of mind of not scrambling around for, you know, oh my gosh, this is valuable, I need to save that, or that's valuable, I need to save that. The, the R in fire is ready, just be race ready. 
be environmentally aware. And, and I like the question about the community. I, I would invite you all to get to know your neighbors, get their phone numbers, get emails, get access, text, right? So bottom line is just family first, get the insurance, optimize the insurance that you have. That's what it's there for. Don't use your own dollars to protect yourself. Leverage your dollars. Be race ready as much as possible. Get things up in the cloud. Anything that's important, back it up and be environmentally aware of the people around you. Um, exit paths, different alternative ways to get to where you want to get to. So I'm John Gosaran with Nevada County Office of Emergency Services. I've been doing emergency management now for about 15 years. I uh, did about 13 years in Butte County. So one of our biggest risks is wildfire. So what do we do? You know, for emergency management, it's preparedness, response, mitigation, and recovery. Those are my four phases, you might say, of emergency management. So for businesses, what can we provide you as a county? Um, what can government provide you? We just finished our uh, local hazard mitigation plan. So this mitigation plan is 912 pages long. Oh my gosh, I don't expect you to read it. <laughs> there's an executive summary in there, and there's a hazard assessment in there. That's the part that you can look at. So our goal in government is to get business back into business as fast as we can. We want to be resilient, back to normalcy. If I get the hardware stores open, the food stores open, people can start rebuilding and going back to their life, you know, normalcy. Under insurance is a big deal, big problem. Um, I've seen it all over the place. And for um, just private citizens, a great example I have is an elderly lady. She's 88 years old, a little bit of dementia. Lived here since 1973, lives in a trailer. They bought the trailer brand new in 1973 for $20,000. She was insured for $20,000. Fire goes through, how do you replace a trailer for $20,000? You can't. And again, everybody says, oh, FEMA's gonna come in. Well, FEMA, when they come in, a max $34,000. That's all they can do to give you as a family unit, $34,000. Unfortunately, had this lady didn't, had no insurance, she would have got $34,000 from FEMA. But since she was underinsured, she had insurance, eligible for hardly anything. And I think we got her like about $6,000. Um, I'm working on getting her a couple more thousand dollars. But fixed income, been a part of this community since the 70s. That's important to me, again, people. Yeah, so they have a tool here. It's called a hazard HVA. Uh, hospitals use it a lot. Um, it's very easy to use business. I've seen them many times, again, generally from the hospitals. Uh, it's very simple to use. And it's just a number type system. And then you go through this and say, OK, this is my biggest hazard. Now, sometimes things get skewed on that. Like, if I do a meeting right after, and let me see, the dam was in February. If I did a meeting in March, everybody's going to circle dam failures, number one. <laughs> um, Nevada County, yes, we do have a few dams here. There are some risks here, but not as much as other uh, dams. They're, they're called uh, high hazard dams. Orville Dam is one of that. And a lot of the way to get that terminology, if you have a lot of people living below it, easy way to put it. So that's an easy tool. It's free. So you can use it. Doesn't, not nothing complicated about it. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Robin Friedman. I'm the regional disaster officer for what's called the Gold Country Region. That's the 24 uh, counties of northeastern California. I've been in the position for about four years, and uh, my job is to make sure that disaster cycle services are provided across the 24 county region from our network of approximately 850 volunteers throughout that area. Now, I've been back here in California for four years, and the absolute number one recurrent risk across the 24 counties absolutely is fires and wildfire hazards. The other one that we have a lot of is flooding. And what's gonna be important for you as business owners and managers is knowing what those risks are and how you're going to address them. You've all seen these numbers before and you wouldn't be here if you didn't recognize that there's a reason to prepare yourself and your organization uh, and your industry uh, for what, uh, what could potentially happen. Up to 40% of businesses fail following a natural or human-caused disaster. 34% of small business owners 
uh, believe a disaster could seriously disrupt their business within the next two years. And disasters come in many forms. And as we we're uh, focusing on here today, it, wildfire is absolutely one of them. But there's all sorts of things that can take a business out of business. Next slide, please. I think some of these numbers are a little bit low, and you'll hear them a little bit differently. Four out of five businesses fail uh, uh, after the loss of a key executive. And that's especially true with small businesses, that one key person can make the business fail for a variety of reasons. One third of businesses surveyed had no business continuity plan. And that number, I think it was 60% for yours. Small businesses, one third of businesses surveyed have no business plan at all. And finally, um, the good news is if someone can make it easier for you to have a plan, you're gonna do it and it's gonna help you. That's, and that's very true. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Ready Rating. Ready Rating is the uh, Red Cross uh, sponsored business preparedness tool. It's online um, and it's designed to help you build, dust off, or update your plan. Uh, it's, uh, it provides specific tools for emergency action planning templates. And f from my perspective, what's great about it and other tools that you have is uh, it provides you a methodology, a consistent methodology to get to where you need to go. Next slide, please. So if you go to readyrating.org, what you're going to get is the following things. First of all, you're going to have a measure for your current preparedness level, and that's important. Uh, having an understanding and a comparison with others is absolutely important for figuring out where you need to go. It will help you improve your plan. It will provide some of the tools that uh, the employees need to know because a business continuity plan doesn't work if nobody knows about it. Uh, I'll tell you another little story. My office, we're at the American Red Cross. We rent our facility. How many of you rent buildings that you, that you potentially use? Okay, renting buildings have some advantages and some disadvantages. Our building didn't have any smoke alarms in it. This is the American Red Cross. <laughs> One third of my responsibility is preparing folks for it, and we didn't have smoke alarms in it until we went through this particular process that's, that's uh, important. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, if you go to rayrating.org, you become a member of a community of other businesses that can share uh, instructions and tools and examples of things along those lines. It's not just a bunch of folks telling you what you have to do, but you will be provided connectivity with others that are in the same type of business that you have in, and it'll provide you an opportunity to discuss important factors with them. Next slide. Um, it also, there's, there's two different types of assessments that can have sort of a quick, dirty one that takes about 30 minutes and one that, that takes about an hour, not a, lo a long amount of time but it basically asks you questions and then helps you con uh, conduct an assessment of where you are and what you need to do along those five different categories, participation, emergency planning, facilities and equipment, training and exercises, and the extended community. Next slide, please. The first one that's discussed is participation. If, if, every, if your organization doesn't have participation among its peers and counterparts, you're going to have a challenge. You've got to make sure that folks participate both in the assessment process as well as in the implementation side of it. My job at New York University, I had challenges in participation because anybody ever work in a university setting or a college setting? Okay, universities. The kings of the university are the deans. There were 23 deans. If I did not get the deans to participate in this process, nothing was going to happen. The other king of the university are the folks in facilities, the folks that make sure that the power plant runs, make sure that the garbage gets picked up, all of those things. If you don't have participation from them, you're not going to be successful. The third most important part were the folks that ran the dorms, because if you don't take care of the students, uh, who are your biggest client, you've got a real problem. And the fourth biggest group were the folks that took care of on-staff faculty. If you live in New York City, it's a little expensive to live there. Guess where all the professors live and all the other folks? They live on university-provided housing. 
guess what? Most folks in a university setting, professors that have tenure, tend to be a little older. Now they're living in a 20-story building. What happens when the power goes out in a 20-story building? You've got to consider that sort of thing. And every one of your organizations and businesses are going to have a similarly odd little challenge. You've got to get participation from every one of those groups to be successful. Uh, the second key step is emergency planning, understanding the possible threats to your organization and possible impact. Like I told you, New York's a little bit different than around here. Fires are major con one of our major concerns. Flooding is another major concern that we have. You're going to have something else. You're going to be living next door to a solid waste disposal plant or a natural gas company. You, and that HIVA that they spoke about will help you with it, but you're going to know best what those risks are around your neighborhood. You need to include that in the emergency preparedness planning process. Next step, uh, slide please. Sorry. Always a backup. Facilities and equipment, that's the third bullet of, uh, that occurs along those lines. And as I sort of discussed, you've got to understand what the stuff is, what equipment you have, and how it's going to, to work together. Fourth bullet is about training and exercises. You're going to go through a little tabletop exercise here. In my office, the most important exercise is around when the power goes out. I got no backup generator in my location. And guess, in my office, I'm in the center darkest office that there is along those lines. So conducting an exercise of getting out of our building or being able to con uh, continue operations along those lines is important. And it shows every time I do an exercise and folks kind of stumble around in the dark for a little bit of time, and they forget, oh yeah, I got a flashlight that's in my drawer because we were provided flashlights is very important. So a variety of training and exercise will be valuable. And finally, working with your extended community, your partners in the first responder community, your neighbors next door, making sure that those are all uh, coherent in, in, in your head are especially important. Next slide, please. Okay, when you get into ready rating, you're going to have uh, access to a series of simple questions. As I said, there's like a 30 question one and like a 60 question version. You're going to determine which one you want to do. They're basically yes, no sorts of questions that are going to guide you. Next slide. And then it's going to give you a, what's called a next step report. Similar to what we have, the next step report helps you with a guided series of actions that you can take and do in relatively near time to make yourself better prepared. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of the ratings report. Next slide. Uh, there's also a resource center similar to what we have in uh, as Valley Vision is put together uh, that will provide you a series of checklists, forms, videos, white papers, anything that you need to have to both uh, uh, um, get your employees and your partners up to speed and to provide you some references are available at no cost. Next slide. Uh, those are some of the videos, I believe. Uh, these are some of the videos. So there, I think there's 30 of them that are uh, on the site itself. And the videos are very instructive. The uh, woman on the top is the uh, emergency manager for Microsoft. Uh, I was up in Seattle, Washington area. And, and it gives you some great insight into the challenges for some of these larger organizations. There's similar versions of this for small and medium-sized organizations that are uh, involved in this. Finally, emergency action plan. Uh, it's really not the plan itself, it's the planning process that proves valuable. When an emergency happens, norm most of the time, what you're not gonna do is open up that 700-page plan. What most people do is what they did the last time something like that happened. Most people will do exactly the same thing they did the last time, even if it's wrong. Even if what you did was wrong and didn't turn out well, most people during an emergency will do exactly the same thing. So what you want to do is you want to do an exercise where people get to the right solution as the last thing that they remember before that happens. EAPs are important for focusing them in and then planning on it. They're not the be all end all. This is an example of a generator. It's going to provide you with a way to get to that plan and make sure that it's consistent. And last of all, one of the last steps is there's going to be a dashboard. What I like about dashboards, and most people don't get what a dashboard is. So when you're driving your car, okay, think about your car, 
dashboard is what you look down to see how fast you're going, if you got any gas. It's that where you look for a very quick second to see, am I on the right path and am I going the right place? And now we got GPSs, so you look at your GPS too. Dashboards are important because it gives you that place to look down and see, am I still on the right path towards success? Just for that second, uh, and as is important. Uh, and they give you a, a star rating that you can use. Next slide. That's an example of what the dashboard looks like. It gives you a chance to compare yourself against other businesses, as well as your own assessment score based on what you think you should be doing. Next slide. If you're anybody from a big organization, a small part of a really big organization here, okay, there's a way to, to, to tier this stuff. So if you're a small component, you can sign up and have different subsections of your organization uh, on a different sort of a ready rating perspective. That's what it looks like when you turn it on. It's going to start out by asking you three questions, and it'll guide you down the track. Uh, once a quarter, you get an email also from other members of the organizations that are similarly registered if you want to have it to compare yourself against them across the nation. Uh, this is some of the benefits to joining. I think the, the, the greatest benefit is it's really simple and it gets you going down the right path right away. 13,700 organizations were joined as of about a year ago. I believe that number's a little old. But it is the clarion call for you to take action. It does get you moving down that slide. It specifies specific action items that you can do also. It's kind of intimidating to, to head down a road without having very specific items that you can move forward with. This gives you a, a series of specific action items. Next slide. Okay. 